Join me right now is one of the best flyweights in the world, Jose Shorty Torres. What's going on, Jose? I'm nothing, you know, nothing much. I'm alive. I'm, I'm kicking somehow, but I'm doing my thing. How about yourself? Good, good, man. Good. The first first thing I want to get into is the commentated gig. You had a a long, long week in Bahrain not too long ago. Uh, the IMF World Championships and Brave 18. Tell me about that experience. It was a good time. You know, the IMF contacted me. They wanted me to be an ambassador for them since I was the first ever two-time world champ. I you know, was able to be a double weight class champ at Titan FC and show what the IMF could do in the UFC. So they're like, Shorty's the perfect guy. Let's bring him in and let's have him commentate. Let's have him do some other things. For me, I've always wanted to commentate. I've always wanted to be a sports analyst. So just being on the side there and getting more experience compared to some of these other guys who've been around longer, Kenny Florian, Michael Bisping, all these guys. It's like, you know what? Let's let's just get the most out of it. And the IMF literally put me through 120 out of the five days, 120 IMF matches commentating where you don't know these guys. They're all from different countries. The names are ridiculous. you know. So just trying to get used to this and really just kind of wing it. And that's really what commentating is. And I got to work with five different commentators there, and it's – it really was. You had to adapt quick. If not, you're going to get left behind by your your partner by accident or whatever the case may be. So it was really a good time. And at the end of the week, I got to commentate for Brave for the final three fights. And the fights were so exciting that I, I lost my voice by the end of the night. Um, but man, it was it was literally a year, if not years, of work in literally one day. So my resume went through the roof with that. So I'm really really happy about it. Well, so we could see a future in future with commentating in you right i'm hoping you know that's something i'm still working out with brave and you know you look at the ufc for example they've been big on having their fighters come in get a different perspective and you know they they let go of jimmy smith which you know they're trying to say like hey we're trying to have more fighters then have that perspective and have fans go hey i like Dominic cruz let's listen to what he has to say well i'm trying to do that for brave as well and really be you know in a sense and literally outspoken i did it for titan fc a couple times i want to do the same thing for my new promotion Definitely. You have been outspoken. You know, I see you, Eddie Alvarez, Demetrius Johnson. You know, you guys are getting paid. You guys are getting the respect from the promotions, your new promotions. Many consider you guys trailblazers of the sport now. Do you agree with this sentiment? You know, I, I try my best to be a pioneer in the sport. I was called a pioneer as an amateur just because I had 26 amateur fights. 125 straight, two-time world champ, and then you see what I did as a professional was only because of my amateur ranks and what I was able to do. So me trying to go around the world really now, I'm fighting in the Philippines March 15th, it's different. Everyone's like, oh, you're not in the UFC more, what happened? You know, What about this? What about that? Are you ever going to try to be back in the UFC? It's like, there's a lot of fighters, not just myself, that feel more like soldiers that were expendable, and they, there's, there's just no respect. A lot of us, yes, the pay is huge, but we we honestly can care less. We enjoy the sport, you know, that much that you can pay us a dollar, probably still going to do it. It's one of those things that, besides the pay, it's the respect. And I definitely didn't get that when I was in the UFC. So going to these other promotions and now finding my new home at Brave, I haven't even fought for them yet. And I've gotten more publicity and more promotion and more everything than, you know, ever what I did in the UFC. And honestly, what I'm getting now is what I expected in the biggest promotion in the world. And I think that's also why Brave has moved up so fast. You mentioned more promotion, more push. But what other key differences do you see in Brave compared to the other promotions that you have worked with? I think the biggest thing with Brave is that they're going to places that people don't really think of. You know, they've had events in Morocco and in India. Now they're going to the Philippines and Saudi Arabia, all these countries that, you know, just people really overlook. And the thing is, people go, oh, no one's from that country. No one's big. No one's this. Look at, look at Khabib. No one knew about Dagestan. No one even cared about Dagestan. But then Khabib starts dominating. Any Dagestani fighter that fights in the UFC or wherever, they're like, oh, my God, he probably fights like this. Man, he's probably really, really good. And they're legit. You know, so what's not to say that that's not the same in the Philippines, not the same in these other countries as well. Look at when the UFC had the ultimate fighter, USA versus UK, and UK won. People weren't expecting that. UK fighters just came out of nowhere. So it's one of those things that they're giving an equal opportunity to everyone. They're not just going, oh, it's a United States fighter. We're going to give him everything. Oh, he's from the UK. We're going to give him everything. They're really trying to be as equal. And it's a promotion ran by fighters. 
you know, it's not it's not a promotion that are just businessmen. Like, yeah, they they have some smarts to them, but they understand the game and they know, oh, you're you're cutting weight, we're not going to bother you. Hey, if you're doing this, we'll take care of this. All you need this, we got you. So it really is. Uh, honestly, it's a dream come true for any fighter. And I'm really happy to say I'm part of them. How much easier is it to work with Brave? <laughs> it's so much easier. You know, the biggest thing is, like, I, I have my manager and I love my manager to death. But with the UFC, I had to go through my manager to contact UFC officials. Here, I don't have to. Everyone gives me their number. Everyone's like, hey, if you need something, please don't be afraid to call us. Don't be shy. Don't be timid. We will ask and, and answer anything we can. Uh, if we can't, then we'll find the right person to do so. So it really is beneficial towards me. And sometimes my, my manager at times feels like a side check. He, I'm just like, oh, yeah, I forgot to – Remind you about this, you know. Sorry, man. I'm, I know I'm supposed to go through your, uh, through you, but here you go. But man, it if I need something done, I've been able to, you know, contact pretty much everyone. And uh, you know, uh, long story short, you know, I fought with Sheik Khalid back in the day, who was the founder of of KHK and the founder of Brave, and I've known him for three plus years now. And being able to start with him and now end up at Brave, I mean, that's my biggest connection. He's been. Not just a great person, but just such a great friend helping me out. It really does mean a lot. When you signed your Brave contract, I heard you received the signing bonus, which is very rare in in MMA, right? How much of a relief is that going into a training camp? You know, it's funny because uh, I found out when I when I talked about that with Luke Thomas uh, with Luke Thomas on his show. I didn't know that was like breaching the contract that I couldn't state that. I was like, "Oh, whoops!" But technically, yeah, man, you know, they they helped me out, and it's one of those things that they knew I wasn't going to be fighting for a while, but they want to invest a lot in me. So they go, "This is part of the deal. You know, we we want this. We're going to give it to you, and we're going to figure out what's best for you." Because here's the difference between myself and a lot of UFC veterans. Most UFC veterans are in their 30s. They're already out of their prime. They're you know, 35, 36 years old, just really just trying to survive. Honestly, look at Bellator. Bellator just had the event this weekend where you have um, Mirko Kokop and Roy Nelson. These guys are both 39 or in their 40s. It's like, hey, this would have been a great fight back in the day, but now it's like, uh, we're not as excited. Yes, you can use the name, but it's not as exciting. Or there's the veterans that go to KSW, for example. And they want to promote their Polish fighters. Cool, the young Polish guy is going to fight this really, really old UFC veteran, and he's going to beat him up. And everyone's like, ah. The difference for me is I'm 26, and I'm not even close to my prime yet. So they know what they saw when I was at the World. That's why they signed me to KHK. They wanted me in Brave when I was in Titan, but I, I just didn't know where the promotion was going to go at the time. You know, it's it, any promotion that's new, you just never know what's going to happen next. And phew, two years later, I wish honestly, I wish, I wish, and I. I wouldn't say I regret, but I definitely wish I would have signed with them much, much earlier. And mm-hmm. if I would have known about the UFC releasing the flyweight division, that would have been respectable for them to go, "Hey, it's not going to last long. We can still sign you." But they, they did it, and they gave me some really, really bad opportunities because of it. With the signing bonus thing, right? You know, of course, it was the breach of contract, like you found out later on. But I think that that is a good sign for the sport, to be honest, because you got all these other sports that are giving huge signing bonuses to fi- uh, not even fighters, but athletes, right? And it's revealed in the public; it's open to everybody. Why not give that to fighters also? I think you know, and that's the thing is, is fighting. It's such a gladiator sport that a lot of people know that we just want to get in there, let me bang, bro, you know, do your thing. But it's the fact of there needs to be a little more respect with that. We're putting technically our lives on the line. Yeah, I was I was messing around and I was talking on the phone when I got my results from MRI and CT scan of my brain. I was like, cool, the doctor says I'm healthy. Hey, what were you saying? You know, so it's just one of those things that you never know what's going to happen in a sport. I mean, I could have lost against Alex Perez and the doctor could have told me the next day, hey, you took so many shots that we're not going to allow you to fight again. You know, what am I going to do with, you know, technically my last UFC contract was still – you know, the basic contract, which I think I made 14, and that's half of that because I'm giving all the stuff to taxes and coaches and all that stuff. So I'm probably making seven, eight thousand dollars for one fight and maybe not being able to fight again. So, you know, this thing is really, really huge with Brave trying to help out. And I, again, before it was even signed, I talked to some of the fighters, not just the main event guys, but some of the new signees that were in the beginning of the card and what the positive things they had to say about Brave and how they're being treated is. Again, it's a promotion ran by fighters, so they understand the struggle starting from the bottom and coming all the way to the top. So it really is, uh, when I say it, I I really do mean it. It really is a cool thing. 
Now you get to move on. You get to debut at Brave 22 in Manila. Thriller mm -hmm. in Manila, if you want to call it that. Is this your first trip to Asia? Um, I wouldn't say technically Asia because Middle East is in Asia. But oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it will definitely be more East than, than usual. I think uh, I was in Kazakhstan. You know, That was my last time I was in Asia. But this time, I've always wanted to go to the Philippines. My favorite fighter of all time, regardless of sport, is Manny Pacquiao. Mm -hmm. And rumor has it that he will be there in attendance. You know, it, it is a huge, huge thing coming to the Philippines. We already see what Manny Pacquiao, the country follows him everywhere. Whether they're watching in a big arena or they're actually going to Vegas to watch him fight, this time it's at home with their Filipino crowd and the Filipino fighters there main eventing. So... Yeah, I'm just excited to see the crowd and get the energy. Hopefully, I get to meet Manny Pacquiao. That's actually on my bucket list, so fingers crossed. But, man, it, it's not excited for the trip, but I'm excited for the adventure and just overall enjoy a great time because they're putting me up against a phenomenal opponent. It's you know a, a place that never gets many you know fights or big fights, should I say. And, again, it's a place that really supports everyone fighting, not just their, their own people. And I think that's awesome. That would be an incredible moment if you get the huge win, Manny Pacquiao comes into the cage and kind of like gives you, you know, like respect, you know, like, hey, I'll give you this respect. That's like your idol. How would that feel, you know, if that happened? Man, that'd be awesome because, you know, there's only a hand, like I, I've, I've fangirled a couple of times. I like to call it fangirling because I definitely overdo it, but I've only done it maybe twice in my life i can't remember the first one but i know one of them was my i'm a big fan of power rangers and i met jace david frank and he played tommy oliver the green and white ranger i met him and he was actually one of my sponsors too and i was just like oh my god you know, just try try not to freak out you know, and i've met some really really great people but just the things that they have done for me mentally to make me the person i am manny pacquiao is one of them another one's jackie chan hopefully one day but you now i'm just so excited and i i know this one probably won't happen but my sense of respect is I want to spar with them. I'm not to compete with them, not to see if I'm better than them, but just to go, hey, you see my style? It has a little of your style in it. And because of you, I'm fighting. I'm able to do this moment. And I think that's really, really cool. Hopefully one day, fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. Your opponent, Amir Abazi, he's a 25-year-old Iraqi fighting out of London. What can you tell me about your opponent? You know, from what I know, he, he's a refugee who escaped. He, I believe the story was on Instagram that he went to Sweden that eventually went to London for training. You know, he's grew up with a struggle, and I can definitely say much more of a struggle than I had. You know, I grew up in the hood, but, you know, being a refugee is a whole different world, and being able to grow up with that, so I know he's tough. Going to London to being alone and trying to train to achieve your goal is is a huge thing. I know he's a, a multiple-time jiu-jitsu champion. He's 11-0 and undefeated. Beat, I think, in his last fight for Bellator. He's fought in the big stage, Bellator. His last fight, he beat an IMOF world champion at 125. And the guy is a phenomenal fighter as well, but not super notable yet. So I'm going to be his first real big test. You know, he's around my age. I'm 26. He's 25. Two youngins going at it. I have one loss. The guy has zero. I'm hoping to take a zero away, but it really is... Um, you know, honestly, I, I look at it as a, a Ricky Simone, Hani Yaya type of fight. You know, you got one guy that really just wants to go down to the ground and implement that game, and you have one guy that wants nothing to do with it, just stand and bang and put on a show. And either way, I think it is a phenomenal, you know, striker versus grappler contest. I can do both, but why go to your strength when I don't have to? And uh, I'm excited. I, you know, it's crazy. I thought Brave, they're like, oh, you know, we're we're paying you well, we're doing this, we're doing that for you. We're going to give you, I wouldn't say a bum, but we'll give you a tuna fight. You're coming off a loss. We'll give you a little bit of an easier fight and promote the hell out of you. No, nah, they're starting me hard. You know, the, They gave me three opponents, sadly. All three of them couldn't take it. And then eventually Amir Al-Bazi came to play. Then he was able to say yes immediately. All of them were 10-0. and 0. Like I think none of them had a loss. If not one person had one loss. I was like, hey, you guys are trying to get me killed this first fight. All right. like Cool. Like I'm never, ever worried about an opponent, but I was like, Hey man, I haven't lost in five years. Like it'd be kind of nice to get a tuna fight, but overall, it, I think it's even better for me because now I'm the first time ever getting to work with Dean Thomas. First time ever getting to really do personal training. I've never done that before, and and working with Sergio Pettis, Rafael Stotts, uh, Eli Garcia, another UFC vet, and a bunch of other guys. Duke Rufus and the coaches there. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm if I lose. Amir Abazi is beating the best Jose Shorty Torres possible with no excuses. So I'm really excited just overall to to show the world 
I really have. You mentioned Dean Thomas. Right now, you're sitting in Milwaukee. What? Why did you decide to bring in Dean Thomas as one of your main coaches? So, Dean Thomas, I got to work with him once personally um, when I was getting ready for Jared Brooks. He so I happened to be there working with Jessica Aguilar. Sadly, that fight for her got canceled the day of, like an hour before she was walking out, which is horrible. And I was like, "Hey, Dean, do you do you want to corner me? I'm representing ATT, and he's an ATT guy." And just doing pad work for that literally five minute session, I was like, "Man, this is this is awesome. I hope to get to work with you a little more." Then I went back down the ATT, and he works with John Robertson, Kayla Haracho, Jessica Aguilar, like I said earlier, and a couple other fighters that I'm around their size. So sometimes I need bodies, and I can control my strength and size sometimes. So I go with them, and I'm like, "Man, you guys are at another level on the ground. You guys are another level at." at ground and pound and setting up your stuff who's teaching you this and she's like dean thomas dean thomas dean thomas and eventually i was like let me look this guy up let me figure it out let me work with him and just talking with him anyone can teach you some amazing stuff but breaking it down to a science and actually being able to really explain it all i think is phenomenal dean thomas has that ability that's just like my coach at home master bob Shermer being able but being able to work with dean thomas who's working with him Phenomenal athletes. Again, right now working with um, Tyron Woodley, getting ready from uh, Kamar Usman, I believe in two weeks. It's it really is awesome to know that that Dean is splitting his time and let me work in with you know Tyron's camp and too, just the training. I'm telling you, like I was, I just dropped him off before this interview and I was like, I know you haven't been able to watch me spar, but I feel so much more comfortable with a lot of things. I'm I'm really really happy about it. When I say I haven't been this prepared for a fight in, I think, ever. I, I really do mean that. You're coming off your first professional loss. Did you feel that you needed to make any changes in your preparations? Um. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I wrote a letter to myself uh, really depicting my fighting style and, you know, what's wrong with it. And what I believe has worked for me really, really well, but the downsides of it. So I'm still going to be the same me in certain aspects, but there's going to be a lot more aspects that have changed in the fight. Definitely a lot more head movement, a lot more um, just what I need to do to win the fight. And, you know, my last two performances given, I, I 45 days, 54 pounds, uh, 9 days, 26 pounds, 20 days, 28 pounds, in a 45-day span was horrible. Two last-minute weight cuts with two opponents that had full training camps. I wasn't prepared for either of them. I got dropped by a wrestler, and I got, you know, knocked out by a jiu-jitsu guy. You know, so it's just one of those things that I was really given an unfair chance. And it, it does hurt the pride a little bit, but it's a fact that, that that still should have never happened. Even in those fights, I should have fought smarter instead of being the tough guy that says, I can take a bunch of shots. And, yeah, hell, I took 107 shots, but eventually my body went out. So it, it's just one of those things. I want to keep on fighting for as long as I can, and my fighting style is a Justin Gaethje style. It it's not the healthiest as hell. It's damn well exciting to watch, but talking to Tyron Woodley, too. He goes, you don't have to be excited to make a lot of money. You don't have to be excited to keep a job. You have to do what you need to do to keep the belt, and that's what I'm doing. And Tyron Woodley is, again, he's a very well-respected champion. Might not be the most exciting fighter in the world, but he's smart as hell and on top because of it. And that's what I want to be, and that's what I should be doing, and that's what I'm doing now in practice. So, um, man, I, I, I definitely worked on a lot. It's going to be a total of seven months. Since my last fight and, and the things I've done, being able to work with Trevor Whitman, being able to train a team elevation, ATT here at Duke Rufus, working one-on-one -on -one with Dean, and just taking all this advice from all these people, it's I'm, I'm really, really excited. Trevor Whitman, how much of a wizard is that guy? Oh, man. So I only got to work with him twice, like just personally him and I. And I know he's coached many you know, world champions and boxing world champions, which for me, I'm primarily a boxer, or at least I tried my best to be. Mm -hmm. And working with him, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen Rocky Three, where Rocky's coach dies and Apollo steps in as the head coach and he's teaching you know, the, the white guy like rhythm and movement and stuff like that, and, and Rocky's just struggling. That was pretty much me. You know, He goes, hey, you need to do this, and he's doing it seamlessly, and I'm just – um, it just looked bad at first. And eventually I caught the rhythm of stuff and I caught on very, very fast because I knew I only had so many days to work with them. And even today, doing it by myself, shadow boxing and stuff, all we worked on was basics. But the basics just took it to a whole nother level and I'm, 
I'm telling you, it's even hard to do some of the things I do today in sparring because I'm still trying to remember what Trevor taught me and really trying to make that muscle memory, and I believe I have. But, man, it, it, it was one hell of an experience. And he's just like Dean Thomas. Like, the way they break things down, it's to a science, and they can explain it to the average person. And I think that's the best thing to do as a coach is really break it down so anyone can understand it, even if you're not a fighter. You were the Titan FC double division champ. You are a UFC veteran. That puts a big target on your back moving forward. Does that drive you more? You know, it, it really is cool. It's it's different. I was used to being the underdog. I've always been the underdog. You know, I grew up losing everything. My first amateur anything, kickboxing, Muay Thai, MMA, I lost. You know, so I always had to work hard to get to this to where I'm at now. But now I'm on top. There's a lot more pressure on me. The underdog, it's like, hey, if I lost, who cares? Everyone expects me to lose. But now as the favorite, it's there's definitely a lot more pressure on me. I mean, Brave is is promoting the hell out of me. But what if I lose? What's next? Compared to I win, oh man, there's so many more things out there. But if I lose, there might not be anything. You know, so there is a lot of pressure on me. There's a lot of things to work on. But for me, I'm I'm really good under pressure. So being able to do this, mainly coming off my last loss, I want to I want to prove something. I have something to prove, and that's to show I am one of the best flyweights in the world, like you said earlier. And I know I can do it. And if I get a full two month training camp, which I finally do now since January, you know this is going to be an awesome, awesome fight. I'm again, win or lose, you're going to see the best Jose Shorty Tours out there. Yeah, I think that that makes the evolution of yourself you know that that target being on your back it shows that you are going to evolve as a fighter right yeah and you you have to because if you don't ronda rousey if you don't you're gonna get cocky everyone's eventually gonna catch up to you and look what happens after that and then you can't come back to where you used to be look at johnny hendrix i mean there's there's so anderson silva even you know there's so many people who went to the top got too arrogant or cocky and just nothing but bad things happen to them, and, and look where they're at now. So for me, I gotta make sure that even though I, I'm coming off of a loss, and for me, the worst way to lose, it's it's an experience, and I have to really take that in and learn from it. And I believe I really, really have. It broke me down multiple times, and it, it reminds me a lot of stuff I need to do in training. And I've been getting coached by some amazing people mentally, and I think that's the biggest thing in this in this fight is it's the mental game. All right, one last thing before I let you go. You know, fighters, they got the headphones on, you know, before they fight, before they train, you know. You got, you know, you're riding around in your car. I just wonder, you know, for your fans, for the people that are listening, people that are watching, is there any artist that you're listening to right now who you can recommend to people? You know, it's funny that, so <laughs> we've all been making fun of him a little bit, but it's, again, he's the champ. He can do whatever he wants. So Tyra Woodley, anytime you come in the gym, he just he has a set playlist, but his playlist is literally only like two or three songs, and it's usually the songs like he made, you know. So um, you walk in the gym, you're like, oh, Woodley's here. Oh, I think I know that song. Oh man, I'm surprised I don't know the words already. For me, it depends on the mood, it depends on the training, but I mean, walkout wise, I'm a huge Kanye West fan. I'm a big Chicago, and I have a lot of Chicago pride. Kanye West, regardless of what people think of him now, I still enjoy his music, and it, it gets me amped up for really whatever situation that that's coming next. And my my theme song is usually Power. I might change it for this one because I wanna I wanna come out a little different. I wanna come out a little more aggressive, and uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm still thinking about it, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna come out to uh, Monster by Kanye West. All right, March fifteenth, Brave CF twenty two, Manila. Jordy Torres, thank you for your time and uh, good skill to you on your next fight. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. I can't wait to do it again.